What's happening, everybody? How y'all making out? How you doing here? Got a fun episode today with drummer vocalist Adam Criney of both Psych Rockers, The Golden Grass, and Southern Boogie Rockers, Rattlesnake. Um, I was able to catch up with The Golden Grass uh, where they opened up for Captain Beyond who came through town a month or so ago. And uh, being a fan myself of Cactus and Atomic Rooster and uh, Wishbone Ash and a lot of those kind of late 60s, early 70s, blue psych rock bands. Uh, the Golden Grass had that in spades and three-part harmonies to boot. So I figured it'd be nice to mix things up and get some melody up in this piece. And uh, unfortunately, I also talked a little bit about the interview that I wasn't able to finish with drummer Bobby Caldwell of Captain Beyond. Got about 10 minutes into that and wasn't able to finish it. So Bobby, if you're listening, we got to finish that bad boy up. In any case, Adam and I get into acclimating to singing while drumming, uh, crazy European gigs on beaches, drum sets finding their owners as opposed to the other way around, pot brownies, psych rock, Captain Beyond, improvisation, all that goodness. So here we go. Without further ado, Adam Carney, y'all. Crash, bang, boom. <laughs> I'm here with Adam Cranny of many bands that we will talk about. Uh, very interesting last name you got there, man. You were telling me a little bit about that. So there, there aren't many of you. Yeah, that's right. Cranny. It's, uh, it's Bavarian, which I think had a G at the end. Kreinig, Kreinig, something like Kreinig. that. And then, uh, yeah. So we're all, we all have to be related because the bastardized name happened. And then every other Cranny dispersed yeah. in America, probably from you know a few descendants. So. Yeah. But I don't really know any of the others <laughs> that aren't directly related. Yeah. But I'm the most famous on Google. Fair enough. I believe it, man. Yeah. It's a little harder for me being a Smith, man. You got to dig pretty deep. There aren't too many Jody Smiths. There is a Jody Smith that's a famous skateboarder. So he's probably got more press than me. Ah. But uh, yeah. So I'm like, you know, maybe top five, let's say. There you go. Yeah. Not too bad. Uh, thanks for catching up with me, man. Um, last time I saw you with the Golden Grass, one of your uh, bands uh, was playing with Captain Beyond, which was a super cool gig. And not many bands in New York could have fit that bill, but y'all did quite nicely being of the sort of, I would say it's sort of uh, Grand Funk James Gang, sort of 60s, 70s psych rock vein. It was yeah. right, up the, right up the alley of Captain Beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really cool, man. How was it uh, playing that gig and seeing Captain Beyond? For it, was, it was really cool. Uh, I think that we're in a, such an interesting time period right now where a lot of people are aware of these cult groups from the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And some of these groups are still touring. It's so wild. And that we seem to be the only band that would make sense to play with them in New York. So Absolutely. we get the opportunity to, which is really great for us um, because typically there aren't that many other shows right. so unless there's a bunch of 60 or 70 year old guys still touring <laughs> there really isn't much for us to do in this town right um, but uh, it was it was really cool and uh, we got to see them sound check before people were in the place and that was really neat and uh, got to just you know speak with various members yeah uh, and of course, it was amazing to see them perform and just to, to see them keep it on. And, and, and uh, you know, it's very inspiring and, it, you know, it, it provides the fuel to keep us going as well. Absolutely. That we know there's still at least 30 years on our career. Right, right. It's got to be trippy playing sort of this retro style of, of music and then hooking up with a band that you would have been potentially influenced by and playing a gig and complimenting each other so well. That was really cool. Right. Well, you know. I've begun to see the situation uh, from different uh, sort of perspectives as I as I go on, and that I I feel like we it it's so weird that it's absolutely normal. 
Yeah. Like, I feel like we should, that's the band we should be playing. Oh, with. absolutely. Because if it was a different time, we would have been the other band on the bill. Yeah, exactly. And that there's no really real difference involved. We're interested and influenced by the same music that they were. Right. Their heroes are our heroes. Yeah. And, you know, all the the black music, the soul, the jazz that they grew up on were influenced by yeah. that went into their playing. Same thing with us. Right. And all the early rock and roll do up you know all that stuff so yeah. so it, it it it's as as bizarre as it is and sort of the temporal thing if you get beyond that it really makes this make sense and yeah. and i i begin to realize we just play a traditional you know sort of folk art at this point which right. is you know whatever call classic rock hard yeah. rock and roll whatever whatever it is and so we're just playing a, a classical form or a traditional folk form in, in some way and so you know, sometimes you are a new guy playing a folk form, opening up for a guy who's been doing it, but you're still playing the same form in a way. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, the continuum. Uh huh. Um, it was cool seeing y'all, man. Uh, and a bizarre side note, I started to interview uh, Bobby Caldwell, the drummer uh, of Captain Beyond, and we weren't able to finish it. We got like ten minutes into it, so I don't have an interview really that's long enough to release. But I had a really interesting time uh, talking to him, and unfortunately, I've got so many more questions, and we're supposed to pick back pick pick it back up at some point via a remote interview. So mm -hmm. hopefully that'll happen. But. The weirdest thing, one, I didn't quite realize that his name was Bobby Caldwell. So when I was looking up stuff, there's that R&B hit, uh, What You Wouldn't Do For Love or whatever, which was by a guy named Bobby Caldwell, who I always thought was black until I looked it up, saw he was white, and then thought, wait, is this the drummer of Captain Beyond that did this song as well? Right. I was fucking so confused. And then I realized two different white guys, two different Bobby Caldwells, two different musicians. Right. I was, for a second there, I was like, holy shit, this is really blowing my mind. So... <laughs> In any case, that's my roundabout way of saying I didn't get to finish a fucking interview with Bobby Caldwell. Well, hopefully you get a chance to. Uh, yeah, pick it man. Up. Uh, seeing you guys, it was killer. Uh, I really enjoyed all the vocal harmonies. Uh, that seems to be uh, something that y'all certainly accentuate throughout throughout the jams. What uh, what are some of the influences and some of the ideas behind doing that? Other than it sounding awesome. Well, well, thank you. Well. <laughs> When the band started, the vocals were a really important part to us. Yeah. We really wanted to bring that back. And it was sort of a reaction against a lot of the doom and stoner rock that is about screaming and a lot of like anger. Yet at the same time, you hear a lot of these same people talk about how they love all these old bands. Right. But I, I'm not really hearing it in their music so much. Sure. And so for us, it was it was a reaction against that on some level. But it was also the desire to want to go for it ourselves and like yeah. like let's 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 see how how high we can raise the bar yeah for ourselves and so we began to pursue it and it took us years to get really good at it and we're four years into the band now and we're getting really good now but it it can only get better and now we're at the point where all three of us have the ability to be lead singers and back backup vocals so we just switch around so yeah. we're constantly looking for where can we put more vocals in or more harmonies in in every possible moment where there's vocals so as far as the influences, well, I mean, they come from the soul groups yeah. and they come from also like the early classic rock of like CSNY, uh, Buffalo Springfield, sure. the birds, um, or, or all the early country rock. Yeah. Stuff like that is, is, is the main influence, you know, the, the, the West coast, um, psychedelic movement. Sure. And, uh, I would say that, that, that that's where it comes from, and, you know, and, and again, a lot of the soul and Motown, uh, that, that that's a real big influence to us, and uh, it's been a real trip to go down that road because um, I think a lot of people are not prepared for it because it's such a a lost art. Right. But it doesn't seem like it should be, but it just is because people don't really know how to sing anymore or, or even want to try. I think a lot of it is both not wanting to try and probably fear of of trying and sounding bad. Yeah. That's probably a big one. But it, I mean, hell, uh, for a trio, all three guys singing, it's a good call. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we really enjoy. It. I mean, we get off on it big time. Like when yeah. we when we come up with a new vocal harmony idea and we nail it uh, at a rehearsal, we're really excited by it. And and hopefully that that sort of shows when we when we do it live is that like we have a lot of joy about what we do. We definitely right. we definitely want to amuse ourselves. You look like you're enjoying yourselves to me. Um, because that's an, that's also number one reason why we're doing this is because. We don't really have music like, like this to listen to uh -huh. in a modern sense, so we make what we want to hear. Right. I know a lot of bands do that, too, which I think is a, a really cool modern reaction to whatever is happening artistically. Right. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, three vocals, one of which being you. Uh, how long, I guess, 
at which point did you what came first singing or drumming or drumming and singing at all all the same time well like most people i grew up you know playing various instruments and concert bands and things in, right. in middle school grade school I always knew I was going to be a drummer. The first time I heard Injustice for All, it was no That's turning amazing. back. It's and just, Metallica is the gateway for so many people that I've talked to. As it, as it should be. <laughs> um, and what happened to Lars's drumming after that album, I can't really talk about or right. speculate. But I'd rather just like let it go. Yeah. And uh, you know, <laughs> I'd rather discuss how the pyramids were built because maybe I'll get a, a quicker answer, more satisfying answer. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, um, I went into my bedroom. And I set up the Quaker oatmeal container and the iced tea container yeah. and the pots and pans and the chopsticks in my hand, and I made a drum kit. Nice. And I would drum along, and I always knew it's what I wanted to do, and finally I got the chance late in high school, got my first drum kit. So that was about 93. So I was playing drums, you know, ever since then, and never really sang uh, too much. Yeah. But um, that wasn't something that I needed to do ever. And then I really got into instrumental music and improvisation and free jazz and all this stuff in around the early 2000s. And that's really what I focused on. Yeah. And all of my groups were purely instrumental and there was no vocals involved whatsoever for years and years and years. And about 2008, I was on a tour and I realized that a lot of the music I was making at that time with my main group, La Utrecina, had turned more song oriented. And at this point I felt like the vocals are missing. And since it had been my band at, up to that point and nobody else seemed like they were going to do it, I just said, well, hey, I'll start singing too. I'll figure it out. Yeah. And so I just began to stumble my way down the road and figure it out. And it took years and years and experimenting and failing. And I, yeah. you know, I cringe at the old recordings of, of myself singing. Other people, not so much. Yeah. They're like, we love it. It sounds so cool and this and that. But to me, I'm not happy with the product. But um, I just kept working at it. And then when I put this group together, I, I stepped it up even harder. And I pushed even harder to get better at what I do. And I took vocal lessons here and there. And I, re I record every single rehearsal. And I listen back to what I'm doing. And I'm constantly monitoring the yeah. process and trying out ideas. And eventually, I'd say only in the past year did it really finally click. So at this point, it's been about eight or nine years that I've been working at it. So, you know, that came second, singing. But, right. but it, it, it's something that now nobody will let me, nobody will let me not sing anymore. <laughs> right. Everyone's like, sing more, sing all the time. Yeah. We need you to sing here. And I just wish I could play my drums. Right. But I don't get the opportunity anymore because now people know that I can sing. Uh -huh. They want me to sing all the time. Or if somebody else in Golden Grass has a lead vocal, they want me to sing harmony to the whole line. And I'm like, right. really? I just can't I just can't <laughs> play? I just can't groove? Yeah. Because I, in some ways, I have to supplement how I'm playing. I, I can't maybe do, do as many fills or be as creative. But, um, you know, whatever. It, it, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, it definitely... It definitely has allowed me to up my independence quite a bit. Sure. And... Uh, and, you know, not focus on drumming so much so that the drumming could just happen. Right. In, in an interesting way. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so that's that's where it's at. So I'm about, I'm about what, 20, 24 years of yeah. drumming and about eight or nine years of singing at this point. Uh, I feel like it's singing is about, feels about 20 years behind the drumming, though, mm -hmm. which has always <laughs> been the bizarre situation is that I started singing in a band where we were all like really fucking good musicians. Right. And that was the weakest point, yet the biggest focus. Yeah. So it was always like fighting as hard as I could to figure out a way to like make it passable against the level of drumming and the other musicianship. So I know. I've always been competing with myself in this weird way and being really hard on myself at the same time because the vocals I knew couldn't be as good as my drumming. Uh huh. So trying to focus on that more and, and, and make up for it in some ways. But I, I finally feel maybe in the past few months that I don't hate my voice anymore, but it really right. took that long to come to terms with it and, and just be okay with what I sound like singing.
did you move to uh, to New York? Or I guess was that about the time did that coincide with doing La Otracina as well? What happened is I was um, I grew up in Jersey, but as soon as I graduated, I was I was gone. I went to school in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, which is where all my early you know pop punk and you yeah. know, hardcore kind of bands formed. And I would begin to get exposed to other kind of musics there. Like I went to school. One of my friends then we're not friends anymore, but it was like Ty Braxton from Battles and Cool. And um, uh, you know, and there were lots of people uh, who uh, showed me different types of things there sonically that opened my eyes a little bit. And then a bunch of us moved up to Boston afterwards, and we had kind of a math rock kind of band called the National Blue okay. up there. And then after about three or four years, I got kicked out of the band for being a not nice person. Oh, yeah. Which I wasn't. I, it's true. It's true. I got what I deserve. Okay. And I was uh, uh, unceremoniously ejected from Boston by everybody that I knew. Okay. And I landed on my feet very quickly in Brooklyn in 2003 when it was still an interesting place to be. And the only thing I wanted to do was play free jazz. Yeah. And so I found as many people as I could here and had huge jams in my basement of my old loft I lived in and just immersed myself in improvisation, forgot about rock and roll or anything else, and just dove into a whole new world sonically. And uh, at the same time, started La Otra in 2003. Okay. And that was to do more progressive rock, psychedelic stuff. I could hear that. Certainly, there's definitely the more like jam and improv kind of psychedelic haw Hawkwind kind of like yeah. thing happening with that band, I would say. Yeah, That's improvisation cool. is always... Once I stumbled upon it, I never didn't want it to be a part of any group I was in because it just seems so essential to mm -hmm. uh, expression to me. And, and catharsis seems to be uh, a part of it in such a way that, like, I mean, you can view improvisation as, like, what did you eat today? Is your stomach hurt? Well, then you're going to play it in a certain way. And right. Are you fighting with your girlfriend? Well, then you're going to play in this certain way, and it's going to come through and to let these things come through mm -hmm. but also let other choices come through i don't know do you want to play this part softer or faster or slow and just to like uh, let the music have this flexibility in, in some way you know from anywhere you know from zero to a hundred choose how much you want sure. to much you want to apply it um it's always dependent upon where you're at so it's evolving and yeah dependent on that so yeah so so yeah so that, that that really opened up my mind you know getting into free jazz and things like that really opened up my mind to how to approach composed music yeah uh, which i think is one, been one of the most valuable tools and also i think what aligns us and you know me and my visions with all these guys from the past right they grew up listening to jazz yeah they didn't grow up listening to nirvana um the, everything they grew up listening to consciousness expanding music so you did la otracina for how many years then i just uh nailed the coffin shut last year okay after probably about 20 lineups and about probably about 20 releases and about six unreleased albums i'm sitting on on my computer oh my god and countless tours it never happened the way it was supposed to the lineups never worked out the the tours never came together right uh we never got noticed until we had a very good lineup but the wrong vibe between band members mm. And we did get to go to Europe for two months and do a massive 47-day, 18-country tour. No way. Yeah, uh, in 2012. Great musicians and music, uh, I mean, I really stand by it, but it, we didn't really have a good rapport. And it wasn't the lineup that people knew, which was the album I just gave you, The Reality Has Got to Die lineup. Right. So it wasn't... Um, that's what people wanted it to a degree. Yeah. And I mean, my response can only be like, well, sorry, you weren't at the club with the one other person <laughs> when we toured through Knoxville all those years. You know, right, exactly. I mean, sorry, we tried and we did. We went out and loser tour after loser tour in the U.S. Yeah. And we had no tie into the European market. By the time they, they found out about us, we were already not really functional. And I put together an ad hoc group. And yeah. Tried, tried getting some old people back in the band over the last few years, and it didn't really work out. Yeah. Um, but um, I feel like anybody who's paying attention can see, like, the lineage of Golden Grass. Sure. A, a continuation of me just becoming a better songwriter, too. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, the, the wildness of, of La Otrecina is, is still there. But as far as a concept and as far as, like, a name, I needed to put it to rest because... It didn't hold any weight anymore. With that many members, it sounds like you 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 gave you, your due diligence was yeah. paid in full. 
<laughs> and I couldn't find band members in New York City anymore. You know, the, the fertility of musicians in New York City has changed over the past however many years you've been here. Yeah. I used to be able to put up an ad citing the most obscure groups on Craigslist, and I would get people to respond to me. Right. Because those people still lived here. Now they don't even move here or live here. Because right. Because nobody, nobody random moves here. Only rich people move here. Or, right. Uh, so... People looking to do exploratory music aren't just going to end up in New York City anymore. Not so so I, much. I couldn't find musicians for that project and teaching people all the music and the yada yada. And just the emotional, I mean, we can all speak about these. The emotional attachment of bands as names, as concepts, as ideas is fucking strong. Yeah. And when you let go of them, it's like, ah. That feels fantastic. <laughs> and you, and you, could, you could have the same band members, even the same music, but call it by something else and somehow it's free. Right. And it's new. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that and embraced it and I put together golden grass and it took off instantly. So I knew that that was like the right decision to do. Yeah. So I put that, I, 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 after the 2012 tour, um, which I do want to ask you one thing about Yeah. was with all that many shows, man, what were some of the coolest or craziest places that you played while you were in Europe? Cause that's a, that's a lot of shows. Man. Well, we started the first show was at Roadburn festival. Oh, that's awesome. And the, and the last show was at Duna Jam, which is a invitation only secret festival in wow. Sardinia in the Mediterranean off Italy. And we played on a beachfront in what? front of. What? Yeah, you can, there's video you can look up on, uh, really? on YouTube of it. We played about 25 feet from the ocean. And there was only like 150 people on the beach watching us, but it's like really cool. We stayed there for five days. Whoa. Yeah, and uh, that was the last show of the tour. Um, it was amazing, yeah. yeah. That's a hell of a and way to cap played, it off. Yeah, I mean, we played we played in really crazy countries like uh, Slovenia, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Romania, wow, um, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, and I mean, and and all over. And it was just it was really cool and made a lot of great friends there that like still are involved in my musical career. And um, the driver on that tour is now has one of like the biggest booking agencies in in Europe, and we still work with him, Sound of Cobra. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it set it set the groundwork uh, for for a lot. Um, the vibes of certain people that I was on tour with and the other band we were on tour with uh, were not that great. Yeah, and there was a lot of like heavy emotional stuff for me, despite feeling celebratory and going on this massive tour. <laughs> yeah, it was very painful at the same time. So it was it was a, a really heavy experience, and I definitely definitely you know feel like I went through a heavy ego death on that tour, and then I came back. And then I went and worked on a pot farm in Mendocino <laughs> that same year and had an even further spiritual death and came back and started the Golden Grass. Oh, bam. And ever since, it was like a, a real blossoming. So yeah. that year was all about dying for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and the uh, rebirth. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a really interesting story, all of it, and the more details of things like that. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so those were the most interesting shows. And the, the bookends were these massive awesome festivals these legendary things and yeah and uh yeah so that was that was that across the guys uh, that inevitably formed, I guess, the Golden Grass? Uh, Michael is the uh, guitar player and singer and songwriter with me. And he uh, had a band uh, called Whooping Crane um, okay. in the area. And they were like kind of like a hard rock, boogie bluesy band. Yeah. Um, they uh, never really took off. I saw what they were always trying to do, but never were able to do. And I think they were, had he had finally gone inactive, unable to find the right players. Yeah. And he was around, and I always knew he was around. And well, this is the story. Um, <laughs> basically, when I was on the pot farm, I knew I would have lots of time to kill. Yeah. So I brought all these old recordings I had made from years prior that I had never gotten through, like rehearsal tapes. And yeah. So I was listening to one one night, really stoned on some pot oatmeal I had made, <laughs> and I was listening to a rehearsal tape for a band that he had auditioned for. 
and we ultimately passed on using him. But uh, I listened to the tape and I was like, this is fucking great. What the fuck am I listening to? And I realized it was with him. I'm like, wow, we passed on him. He's pretty good. Like, this is strange. And I, and I said, yeah, I guess he wasn't ready for what we ended up doing with that project, yeah. which ultimately failed. Yeah. But I should give him a call when I get back. I got some new ideas brewing. Yeah. And I did. And I called him when I got back. And we got together New Year's Day 2012, 13, like that, that day. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Now, I know you were talking about doing a, uh, you got a tour coming up mm-hmm. with Golden Grass. That's right. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and the subsequent th- uh, things that you have lined up. The 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 the, the, in, the insane timeline. It was, yeah. It was, tell me the timeline here, please. Uh, forever. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, we haven't toured the states in years because once we found our niche in Europe, we just toured there because it's, the way it's to really it. hard to make things happen in the U.S. and, and have consistency and etc. And we were being received well. Our records were coming out over there, and we didn't really get any offers from any booking agencies or otherwise here so we're like right. well we'll keep it to local shows regional shows we didn't go to europe this year for the first time in three years and i wanted to do something uh-huh so we said hey let's tour the u.s let's do a little mini thing so we put together a nine-day tour uh out to illinois and back and we're going to do a day trotter session as well which is uh do you know what that is uh-uh. it's a it's a, a company in uh moline or uh well not moline in the quad cities of illinois and uh, iowa and they record bands and videotape them online doing three songs. And then they stream it on their site. And they, you know, it's kind of like a stop in, maybe do an interview or something like that. And a lot of big indie bands have toured through and done it. So it's, it's got a really cool nice. thing going on. And um, basically, we're, be, we're going to be touring our entire new album, which is what you saw yeah. at Captain Beyond. Half of that show was the first time we ever played those songs live, by the way. Oh, cool. Um, so all of this stuff is very new, very fresh, and we're going to tour the hell out of it for two weeks, play it every night, and take these songs to the absolute limit of what they can be, Yeah. and immediately come back home, go into the studio and record them and mix them over a two-week period, Okay. and send the files overseas, and hopefully see this out in the springtime of 2018, back in Europe for another tour. So yeah. that's the timeline we're looking at. A lot of so, lot of elements need to fall in line. Yeah, but I have no doubt. No it's kink all, in the chain. It's all about, you know, just, just projecting, like, <laughs> zero problems and, you know, m- manifesting the output that you want and, yeah. you know, focus. And uh, we're all really well rehearsed and we're all f- – we just have a clear idea of how it's all coming together. And I'm working super hard every time I get home I'm on the computer, making every little bit fall into place and – I think it's going to work out great and we're we've never been happier with the material we're working on right now so uh i think it's going to be real sweet killer i look forward to hearing it man one last thing i'm sitting here looking at this cool drum set that i saw you play uh, yeah. at the captain beyond gig thought it sounded great uh it's an old ludwig kit and you have an interesting story about how you acquired it uh that might be good to tell the folks well i was looking for a drum kit and found a guy selling drums on Craigslist had a bunch of kits but nothing that met my specific sizes or price range and uh, he followed up with me again a few weeks later I didn't have the money and he kept pushing and he kept texting me and calling me and begging me to come over to his house and see his drum kits so finally I did even though I didn't have the money and he showed me a kit that I couldn't even play because it was in his apartment in Greenpoint so I just looked at it and it looked cool but I really couldn't tell how it was going to sound. And he basically made me take it home that day, even though I can only give him $300. And he let me pay the rest of it off and trusted me enough to do so. And of course I did, honorably. Sounds like quite a nice guy. Yeah, but it was a very interesting uh, experience in terms of the kit really seeking me out yeah. and coming after me. And it's very rare that you'd have somebody trust you to just pay them off right. total stranger in new york city oh that's almost unheard of and um and i love the kit and everyone seems thrilled with the way it sounds and i love the way it's been sounding on the recordings i've been making so far and actually this coming uh november when we take it into the studio uh will be the first time i'll hear it you know fully sonically represented so all you out there will get to hear it real soon nice yeah 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 Is there any particular gig that strikes you as being just a complete train wreck or just completely bizarre? I'd have to say the last time 
things were really bizarre was playing the Hudson Valley Psych Fest with Golden Grass about two years ago. And I have a pretty... I'm, I'm looser on it now because I'm getting better at singing. But once I started singing, I realized after a few years, unfortunately, that when I got high, my pitch perception is gone completely. Oh, really? Like, couldn't tell what notes I was singing. Right. And... Basically, I had stopped smoking pot and playing with Golden Grass because it was affecting my pitch. Ah. But there was a whole tray of pot brownies. Oh, boy. At the Hudson Valley Psych Fest. <laughs> and I specifically remember eating one, and then we're about to go on, and all of a sudden, I got really fucking stoned, and I couldn't tell how I was singing any way, shape, or form for the entire show. And it was really embarrassing and mortifying to me because I'm sure I completely ate shit at that one uh -oh. as far as singing. And I went against my golden rule of right. not doing that. And it totally <laughs> fucked me up. And, uh, you know, but, but, but I mean, I, nobody knows on the outside usually. When yeah. you experience your biggest train wreck, Nobody really... Uh, it's more internal than... It's so internal, but the internal... That <laughs> can inter affect you and it can become a no longer a train wreck. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it just really hits you hard. But I have to, be, I have to say, like, it, it's not that often when things go really bad. I mean, I can't think of any time where something really terrible happened, like yeah. uh, in the audience or to one of the band members or something broke. I, I guess I've been fortunate in, the, in that capacity. Yes, you have. But... Um, you know, I'm going to knock on wood here. Yes, do it. That uh, things continue to be uh, to be flawless uh, yeah. Yeah, to 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 a degree. But yeah, no, I, I think I think I think I'm on a good roll. Nice. Yeah, I want to, and I want to keep it that way. So please, universe, keep keep me rolling smooth. Keep it rolling. Another band of yours, Rattlesnake. Yeah. More on the uh, the, the boogie southern uh, rock uh, guitar mini uh, thing <laughs> happening. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I dig it. It's really cool. Tell me a little bit about this band. Well, this one um, has taken a little bit longer than I thought to get off the ground. There were some lineup issues early on, and it was tough to find a bass player. But we finally began to gig out in May of this year, and we played a few shows locally. And um, we're basically writing as much as we can, and uh, just trying to expand our repertoire and see what we come up with. And we've got a you know initial batch of songs, but I just want us to keep working, keep writing, and keep getting good. If we haven't gotten any offers from labels. We've we issued a demo, and yeah. we're happy with it. But you know, no labels have really stepped up to want to do more. So we're just going to keep writing and keep having fun and just let the process unfold. Yeah. And our next big gig is in New York, uh, late October, opening up for Manila Road. I don't know. And um, they're like an old school um, metal band from the early 80s. It's actually their 40th anniversary tour. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, they've been around for a long time, and they're like a really cool, like hard rock, early metal crossover okay. kind of thing. Yeah, Manila Road. All right. Yeah, their their legendary album is called Crystal Logic. You should you should <laughs> okay, check it out. Okay, I'm check it out. So it's pretty cool to be opening up for them because I think mostly they play with metal bands. Yeah. So they'll get to play with like a rock band. Yeah. As a, as opposed to that, because there is such a rock element in what they do. It's not definitely not purely metal. Um, right. And uh, yeah, so for this group, it was more about exploring different musicians and a little bit of a different sonic palette a little bit of a more straightforward 
push as opposed to a jazzier element, which is in Golden Grass. Right. And definitely more of a Southern rock influence on this one. Yeah, no doubt. And really trying to capture this moment between the late 70s, early 80s, where metal and Southern rock really crossed over. Yeah. There's not a ton of bands that really nailed it, but there's bands like Point Blank and Blackfoot and Black Horse Mm -hmm. and Hydra. If I can name a few, Molly Hatchet. Molly Hatchet, sure. Yeah, man. But it, it's not it's not like a a super popular meeting point. Yeah. But the bands that nailed it, it's so mind blowing what they came up with. Definitely. I, for me, it's about exploring that realm some more in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think even uh, in the early seventies, uh, like with Atomic Rooster or um, uh, Cactus or mm-hmm. some of those bands, Absolutely. that was like blues based stuff with maybe some southern, uh, you know slide guitar playing at times yeah, or whatever absolutely. and some shit like that but real kind of hard driving drumming you know uh, killer drumming in both of those bands Wishbone Ash was another one that had some absolutely, real cool shit absolutely absolutely Wishbone so, Ash is definitely definitely an influence yeah yeah and had the guitar harmonies as well to, to boot yeah, yeah. that's killer man well yeah I look forward to uh, to checking out that show man cool that's, that's, that should be a good one that will be a good one yeah yeah uh, what else do you have going on uh, for the rest of this year man it sounds like this tour the recording I mean, some more Rattlesnake stuff basically as soon as the Golden Grass record is you know off to the presses we don't have anything pushing us so we can probably take a little bit of a breather and I am looking forward to completing a bunch of records I have sitting on a hard drive that just need to be mixed and maybe vocals added. Right. And getting out a lot of old material that's just been sitting around. I have a label, too, called In For The Kill Records. Okay. And just issuing all this old stuff, getting it up online on Bandcamp and getting it out to the world. And then the last uh, musician that I played in La Utrecina with, a multi-instrumentalist named Ian Anderson. He lives in Scranton. We have a new group that we are going to record an album together. It's definitely going to be in the heavy prog territory, more along the lines of classic stuff like Magma and Goblin. Right. So uh, really heavy and dark and mean prog stuff. Cool. Uh, Instrumental, probably most likely. There might be some vocals. So And we're just going to record all the instruments ourselves and just try to do it all in a weekend and just construct everything sort of halfway on the spot and just build things up and do overdubs and do it all ourselves and this project is going to be called electric storm okay yeah cool and i'm really excited to get the electric storm album out it's been something that's it's we just have like a three minute demo i've been sitting on yeah. and, and like i love it so much and we never got a chance to work on it more because i just seen a folded and he lives three hours away, but we keep talking about it. And yeah. So it's going to happen. So that's... The storm's that's gonna, a brewing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's electric, baby. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Thanks for tuning in, as always. Be on the lookout for both the Golden Grass and Rattlesnake coming to a town near you. Thanks, Adam, and thank you, the listener. Subscribe on iTunes if you haven't already. That shit's free. It don't cost you nothing. You can even get updates when a new episode uploads. How about that? So we'll catch you on the next one. Crash, bang, boom! Boom!